Hi, hello, and welcome to The Word. Today we want to look at faith and the remnant church. If you noticed when we dealt with the LDS and SDAs, it was all about the last day church or the true church, which is normally called the remnant. But is that concept in the Bible? Is it a remnant church or a remnant people? Are they one and the same? It seems to open up a different idea once we have laid it out on the table. Are we saved through a body or are we saved through Jesus Christ, regardless of who preached to us? Can we promote Jesus and not our church? Is it possible? Ready to study? Let's get started. Our journey with Jesus has taken us to healings, great teachings, common winds and waves. But we have not seen him raising the dead. That's not on the mind of anyone yet. The gospel writers continue to give the accounts of what they were told Jesus did and said. Every account had a purpose. It was to instill in the minds of the readers that there was a man named Jesus and he was the son of God and he did these wonderful things. Not just that he was the son of God, but according to John, he was the word made flesh. And according to Matthew, he was Emmanuel, God with us. It is this sterling truth that sets followers of Jesus apart from all other religions with their many gods and their sacrifices and multiple forms of devotions. We are again going to plunge into the power of God through his son, Jesus Christ, as he continued to heal anyone who requested. But the aspect of faith looms large in all of this. But before we continue, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we have come again because there is no one else that we can go to or we want to go to. There is no one who is worthy of the praise, the honor, and the glory. You are calling us to see your glory through your Son and feel your glory through the Holy Spirit. Channel our minds to spiritual things that we will be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. Fill our hearts with devotion for you, we pray. Though we are weak, we will be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Bless us today as we study your word again, we pray. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our account begins with verse 5 of Matthew 8 today. It says, When Jesus returned to Capernaum, a Roman soldier came and pleaded with him, Lord, my young servant lies in bed, paralyzed and in terrible pain. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. But the officer said, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come into my home. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. I know this because... I am under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say, go, and they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to those who were following him, he said, I tell you the truth. I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. And I tell you this, that many Gentiles will come from all over the world from east and west, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the feast in the kingdom of heaven. But many Israelites, those for whom the kingdom was prepared, will be thrown into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 13. Then Jesus said to the Roman officer, Go back home, because you believe it has happened. And the young servant was healed that same hour. Now that is worthy of speaking about. Now bear in mind a few things. The Jews are under the Roman rule, so a Roman officer is basically a watchdog over the Jewish people for Rome. But the news is spreading about Jesus and he being able to heal. But while this is happening, 
the Jewish people themselves are doubting, dissuading others, and ready to kill him for what he is doing. He begins by saying, I am not worthy, that is the officer, I am not worthy for you to come to my house. On the contrary, the Jewish leaders thought that they were too worthy or more worthy than Jesus himself. The officer is saying, don't come to my house. I have faith that you can do it. I have faith that you can just say it and it will be done. My, my, my. That is some measure of faith. You see, it is easier for those who don't have baggage of previous knowledge to believe than those who feel they have so much knowledge that nobody can tell them otherwise. It is still a dangerous thing today. So Jesus had to tell them, I have not seen such faith anywhere in Israel like this. Verse 14, when Jesus arrived at Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. But when Jesus touched her hand, the fever left her. Then she got up and prepared a meal for him. That's powerful. That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out the evil spirits with a simple command, and he healed all the sick. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, who said, and I quote, He took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. End of quote. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he instructed his disciples to cross to the other side of the lake. Then one of the teachers of religious law said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, Foxes have dens to live in, and birds have nests. But the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. Another of his disciples said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me now. Let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Jesus was saying to them that he has laid up no earthly home. He has none. Are you sure you want to follow me? Well, if you so desire, you cannot be thinking earthly. You can't make decisions based on where it would take you or what you will get from it. You make decisions because it is right. You reject it because it is wrong. As simple as that. But following me is deep. Now, Luke gives the same account of the Roman officer with some more details, a little different. Let's read it in Luke chapter 7. Verse 1, when Jesus had finished saying all this to the people, he returned to Capernaum. At that time, the highly valued slave of a Roman officer was sick and near death. When the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some respected Jewish elders to ask him to come and heal his slave. That's the slight difference here. So they earnestly begged Jesus to help the man. If anyone deserves your help, he does, they said. For he loves the Jewish people and even built a synagogue for us. So Jesus went with them. But just before they arrived at the house, the officer sent some friends to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself by coming to my home, for I am not worthy of such an honor. I am not even worthy to come and meet you. Just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say, go, and they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to the crowd that was following him, he said, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. And when the officer's friends returned to his house, they found the slave completely healed. Luke's account does make it clearer. So we know that the officer stopped him while he was on his way and that he did not go to Jesus directly, but he sent Jewish leaders to ask for the favor. Are you ready to have that kind of faith? 
I want to exercise that kind of faith. Let us now focus our attention on the other half of our study, which is concerning the remnant. Someone had asked me to do a study on the remnant. I think I hinted that the word is not found in the Bible except in Isaiah. Let us read its context and see if we can apply it to the last days, if the word remnant means a remnant church in the last days. Um, Isaiah 11. Verse 1, out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot, yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root, and the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance, nor make a decision based on hearsay. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. The earth will shake at the force of his word and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. He will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like an undergarment. In that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat, the calf, and the yearling will be safe with the lion, and a little child will lead them all, meaning all these animals. The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put its hand in a nest of deadly snakes without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. Verse 10. In that day, the heir to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally to him, and the land where he lives will be a glorious place. Listen to this carefully. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to bring back the remnant of his people, those who remain in Assyria and northern Egypt, in southern Egypt, Ethiopia and Elam, in Babylonia, Hamath, and all the distant coastlands. He will raise a flag among the nations and assemble the exiles of Israel. He will gather the scattered people of Judah from the ends of the earth. Then at last, the jealousy between Israel and Judah will end. They will not be rivals anymore. They will join forces to swoop down on Philistia to the west. Together, they will attack and plunder the nations to the east. They will occupy the lands of Edom and Moab and Ammon will obey them. The Lord will make a dry path through the gulf of the Red Sea. He will wave his hand over the Euphrates River, sending a mighty wind to divide it into seven streams, so it can easily be crossed on foot. He will make a highway for the remnant of his people, the remnant coming from Assyria, just as he did for Israel long ago, the remnant coming from Israel when they returned from Egypt. So my gentle people, does that remotely refer to a special church? No. Isaiah prophesied during the tribes of Israel and Judah where God caused the others to disappear amongst the other nations. There is a prophecy now that is proclaiming that God would bring back the remnant. That prophecy died without fulfillment. It was not fulfilled. And God no longer has a Jewish people because salvation is now in Jesus. So no one should go to this prophecy for any fulfillment. So where do we get the concept that some churches, like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons, LDS, or Catholics, or Seventh-day Adventist Church, is the remnant church. 
We cannot find it in Paul because there is no mention of denomination in any of the writings of Paul, nor Jesus. He speaks to the congregation as people gathering in one particular place, like the brethren in Corinth or the assemblies in Rome, etc. Well, to begin with, the Catholic Church has made its connection by stating that Peter was the first pope. And since he was ordained by Jesus, and Peter ordained the next pope, and the next pope ordained the next pope until this pope, it stands to believe that the Catholic Church is the true church of the Bible because there was no break in leadership from Jesus down to Peter, down to our day. So the Catholic Church calls Christians to come back to the true church. We read from the one true church these statements. There are not over a hundred people in the U.S. that hate the Catholic Church. There are millions, however, who hate what they wrongly believe to be the Catholic Church, Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. When Archbishop Fulton Sheen said these words in the late 20th century, he was speaking about how non-Catholics perceive the Catholic Church teachings compared with what the Catholic Church actually believes and teaches. Clearly, they are two different things. Most times, non-Catholics get it wrong, and even some Catholics perpetuate errors and misconceptions about their own faith. Now, many years later, I am telling you that the Catholic Church is the one true church that Jesus Christ founded, and I was one of those millions. Even our Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, as recent as in July 2007, issued a statement that Jesus established only one church. If you are Protestant, you are probably saying, at this point, how can the Catholic Church make the claim that they are the one true church? Does it mean my church is invalid? The answer to that question is yes. In so far as Jesus Christ set up and left us only one visible church, and no, as being a member of the body of Christ. The Catholic Church only claims that it alone contains the fullness of the truth, thereby making it the one holy Catholic and apostolic, which is true church, that Jesus Christ founded. Many elements of truth can be found outside of the Catholic Church, but as a body of Christians, we are a wounded bunch both inside and outside the Catholic Church. The mere fact that we are a wounded bunch of sinners in the Catholic Church does not in any way diminish the claim to the deposit of the fullness of the truth which subsists in the one true Catholic Church. Protestants are just as wounded as Catholics, but the graces of Jesus Christ are found both inside and outside the Church. To quote Lumen Gentium, Dogmatic Constitution on the Church. Why do you say that Jesus Christ founded the Catholic Church? It is the oldest church in the world, and it can trace its roots all the way back to Peter, the first pope, and the apostles. Further proof can be gleaned from the writings of the first Christians, and in particular, St. Ignatius of Antioch, who was the disciple of St. John, the evangelist, for nearly 20 years, he wrote in his letter to the Smyrnians in 8107, You must follow the bishop as Jesus Christ follows the Father and the presbytery as you would the apostles. Reverence the deacons as you would the command of God. Let no one do anything of concern to the church without the bishop. Let that be considered a valid Eucharist which is celebrated by the bishop or by one whom he appoints. Wherever the bishop appears, let the people be there. Just as wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. End of quote. We also know that the Mormons have Joseph Smith, who was given vision that the only true church on earth is the Church of the Latter-day Saints. And Joseph is its prophet. The Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods were conveyed 
on these elders of that church, which is God's true church. And now, because of that, God's true church can function again in the world. The Jehovah's Witnesses believe that God speaks through nine men at the top, which is considered the voice of God. And whatever they say and however they interpret the Bible, it is correct. So God has reserved the 144,000 who are the only ones on earth to partake in the communion because they will be the only ones translated or resurrected to govern the earth made new. The others will remain on earth and they will be obedient to God. There are people who will give their lives for these beliefs. Listen to this. That's from the Jehovah's Witness. Do Jehovah's Witnesses believe that they have the one true religion? The answer, those who are serious about religion should think that the one they've chosen is acceptable to God and Jesus. Otherwise, why would they be involved in it? Jesus Christ didn't agree with the view that there are many religions, many roads, all leading to salvation. Rather, he said, narrow is the gate and cramped the road leading off into life, and few are the ones finding it. That's from Matthew 7, 14. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that they have found that road. Otherwise, they'd look for another religion. How unfortunate that the words religion and denomination are used interchangeably as though they are the same. A religion is not a denomination. Religions are major beliefs that are either Christian and non-Christian. A denomination is a certain belief amongst Christianity. Now always take note of this phrase, the Jehovah's Witnesses or anyone believe they have found that road. It does not mean they are right, but it just means that that is what they believe. When Jesus spoke of that road, he meant himself, the road to Jesus Christ, not self-righteousness, or another path, or another religion. If you don't, I think you need to take a look at this doctrine of the Jehovah's Witness. That means if you don't know about it, concerning a particular date, the 1914, a significant year in Bible prophecy. Now you must listen carefully. Decades in advance, Bible students proclaimed that there would be significant developments in 1914. What were these? And what evidence points to 1914 as an important year? As recorded at Luke 21, 24, Jesus said, Jerusalem will be trampled on by the nations until the appointed times of the nations, the times of the Gentiles, that's from the King James Version, are fulfilled. Jerusalem had been the capital city of the Jewish nation, the seat of rulership of the line of kings from the house of King David. Psalm 48, 1 and 2. However, these kings were unique among national leaders. They sat on Jehovah's throne as representative of God himself. And that's supposed to be found in 1 Chronicles 29, 23. Jerusalem was thus a symbol of Jehovah's rulership. How and when, though, did God's rulership begin to be trampled on by the nations? This happened in 607 B.C., when Jerusalem was conquered by the Babylonians. Jehovah's throne became vacant and the line of kings who descended from David was interrupted. That's 2 Kings 25, 1-26. Would this trampling go on forever? No, for the prophecy of Ezekiel said regarding Jerusalem's last king, Zedekiah, remove the turban and take off the crown. It will not belong to anyone until the one who has the legal right comes, and I will give it to him. Ezekiel 21, 26, 27. The one who has the legal right to the Davidic crown is Christ Jesus. So the trampling would end when Jesus became king. When would that grand event occur? Jesus showed that the Gentiles would rule for a fixed period of time. The account in Daniel chapter 4 holds the key to knowing how long that period will last. It relates a prophetic dream experienced by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. He saw a tree of enormous height that was chopped down. Its stump could not grow because it was banded with iron and copper. 
An angel declared, let seven times pass over it, Daniel 4, 10 to 16. In the Bible, trees are sometimes used to represent rulership, sometimes used. And that's from Ezekiel. So the chopping down of the symbolic tree represents how God's rulership as expressed through the kings at Jerusalem would be interrupted. However, the vision served notice that this trampling of Jerusalem would be temporary, a period of seven times. How long a period is that? The answer, we go down to Revelation. The answer is found in Revelation 12, 6, and 14. Indicates three and a half times equal 1,260 days. Seven times would therefore last twice as long as 2,520 days. But the Gentile nations did not stop trampling on God's rulership a mere 2,520 days after Jerusalem's fall. Eventually, then, this prophecy covers a much longer period of time on the basis of Numbers 14, 34 and Ezekiel 4, 6, which speak of a day for a year, the seven times would cover 2,520 years. The 2,520 years began in October 607 when Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians and the Davidic king was taken off his throne. The period ended in October 1914. At that time, the appointed times of the nations ended and Jesus Christ was installed as God's heavenly king. Psalm 2, 1 to 6, Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Just as Jesus predicted, his presence as heavenly king has been marked by dramatic world developments. War, famine, earthquakes, pestilences. And that comes from Matthew 24, 3 to 8, Luke 21, 11. Such developments bear powerful testimony to the fact that 1914 indeed marked the birth of God's heavenly kingdom and the beginning of the last days of this present wicked system of things. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. So here is another interpretation of Daniel on a year for a day principle and 1260 days, etc. And eventually all these calculations ended in 1914 when Jesus was installed as God's heavenly king. These are the things that set these churches apart because calculations are correct and therefore everything right goes with this church. Just to bear in mind, Everyone cannot be the true church and still be spitting out different biblical concepts on the same scriptures. So what about the Seventh-day Adventist Church? You mostly hear of the Seventh-day Adventist Church as the Church of Bible Prophecy or the Remnant Church. How is that possible? I will show you. Now, as usual, since it's a study and not a sermon, I can't just say things to you and you shout amen and, and go home. It's a study. So I have to allow you to see things for yourself. Although to many, that does not mean a thing. Facts is only factual when it makes me feel comfortable. Facts is an attack when I am not comfortable. Well, it's not mine to worry about whether you think you are comfortable or not. I'm giving you the opportunity to know what you never knew. You know a day is coming when many people will rush back to these studies because they will be challenged but may not know where to find information and one will remember, oh, Pastor Joseph has some interesting and serious studies. Let's, let's go back and check them out. Don't worry. It's laid down there for when you need it. Ephesians 5.23 For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of his body, the church. So pastor, the word church is used in the New Testament. No, the word ecclesia is used, which we translate as church. They call it the called out people, which is the body of Christ. In a particular location, it is an assembly, but for everyone who will believe around the world, it is the body of Christ. Believers. This is why there is one church. Now, in the same passage, the church is called the wife of Christ, and then in the same breath, it is called the body of Christ. 
How can the wife be the body of the husband at the same time? Well, this is the spiritual theology that God taught us since creation. They twain shall be one flesh. So that is why Paul says a man cannot hate his own flesh. So he will never hurt his wife since she is his flesh. Well, Jesus cannot hurt his own flesh since he and the church are one. That is not physical. That is not denominational, but a universal church. That is why he says in Matthew 20 that no one will know who is wheat and tears until the coming of the Lord of the harvest. There has to be a body of believers who must preach to the world to come to the fold of safety, which is Jesus. Well, which one is that fold of safety? You can't claim it's the SDA church when every other is claiming that it's their church. So we need to know exactly why it must be the Seventh-day Adventist church. I will take this excerpt from the Ellen White estate on Adventism being a unique prophetic movement by James R. Nix. To save you from not having to feel that you are reading too much, I will pretend to be Nix and present this Bible study or this sermon while you read on the screen if you so desire. Seventh-day Adventism, a unique prophetic movement by James R. Nix. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn to Revelation 10. We will be reading from there in a minute. Were I to ask you to define the uniqueness of Seventh-day Adventism, doubtless I would get about as many different answers as there are people here today. Some might see our uniqueness in that we worship on Saturday Sabbath rather than Sunday. Others might mention our understanding of Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary or the prophetic ministry of Ellen G. White. Still, others might point to lifestyle issues such as refraining from certain kinds of foods, amusements, or styles of dress and adornment. In one sense, all of these answers would be at least partially correct. But in the interest of time today, I want to concentrate specifically on Seventh-day Adventism as a prophetic movement. When we do so, we discover that Adventism is unique because of three distinct characteristics. No other church claims these identifying characteristics, but we Adventists have seen them as defining us from even before our official founding in the early 1860s. You remember what I told you of we believe. So it is not that it is necessarily so, it's just that this is what is believed. So let us go on the basis that it is a belief and not a fact in itself. Permit me. Here are the three defining characteristics. One, we are the only people who find our prophetic roots or history predicted in Revelation 10. Two, we are the only people who find our prophetic identity defined in Revelation 12. And three, we are the only people who find our prophetic message and mission given in Revelation 14. In saying this, I must quickly add that we do not make these claims with any attitude of religious exclusiveness or boasting. The issue is not that Seventh-day Adventists are better than, but rather we are different from other churches. So the Catholic Church takes its claim from Scripture. The Jehovah's Witness takes its claim from Scripture. The SDA Church makes its claim from Scripture. And that is the key. Once you can show the connection that God has ordained you to be the last day church, then it's all over. Nobody's going to re-examine that. Why be part of the church if it is not the true church? But is this really the mission of Jesus? Was it to have an organization or a movement or body or a global body of believers in Jesus? He gives the further explanation that is next. Now, he reads from verse 1 to 10, then explains it. Here in Revelation 10, we find depicted events that interest us as we look for the prophetic roots or history of Adventism. 
The little book mentioned in verse 2, 8, and 9, and also in verse 10, is understood by Adventists to refer to the book of Daniel. Although Daniel's prophecy was primarily a time message when he asked the meaning of the time that had been revealed to him. He was told to shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Daniel 12 and verse 4. The message was not for Daniel to then comprehend, but at the time of the end. What for ages had been sealed would be understood. The period of time that Daniel wanted to understand was the 2300 days, at the end of which the sanctuary would be cleansed. That was the only sealed message in the book of Daniel. Many centuries later, on the Isle of Patmos, in vision, the Apostle John was shown a time in the future when a mighty angel would descend to earth, having in his hand a little book. Open, not closed, not sealed, but open. From our vantage point of history, we can see that it was near the end of the 2300-day prophecy in 1844 that this angel with the open book of Daniel set one foot on the land and one on the sea. This happened just as John was shown. At the precise time predicted, the angel's prophetic message embraced the whole earth, or the whole earth. For as predicted in John's vision, Prophetic time had reached its climax. Around the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th, people began studying the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. In so doing, many came to the conclusion that the 2300 days of Daniel 814 would end in the 1840s, thinking that the cleansing of the sanctuary described by Daniel referred to the cleansing of the earth by fire at the second coming of Christ. They concluded that Jesus would return then. That exciting news was soon preached with wonderful power throughout the world. For Seventh-day Adventists in particular, when thinking about 1844 and the years immediately preceding it, the name William Miller comes to mind. But he was only one of many during that time who preached the soon return of Jesus. People like Manuel Lacunza, Joseph Wolfe, Henry Drummond, Edward Irving, Hugh McNeil, and the child preachers of Sweden were also proclaiming the fact that the great time prophecies were about to meet their fulfillment. And then, as they understood it, Jesus would return. And it wasn't just in America or Europe where this proclamation was being made. The message was circling the globe. Wolf preached in the Middle East and North Africa, from Egypt to Afghanistan and England to India. In 1837, he even visited the United States where he also preached. Out in India, Daniel Wilson, Episcopal Bishop of Calcutta, preached and wrote pamphlets specifically on the prophecies of Daniel. In Adelaide, Australia, the message of a soon coming savior was preached with great power by Thomas Playford. Crowds there became so large that his followers had to build a larger church for him. Yes, at the end of prophetic time, precisely as the apostle John had been shown, would happen. And at that very time predicted by Daniel over 2300 years in advance, the message was proclaimed with a loud voice around the world. No wonder our pioneers were excited when they realized that they were fulfilling prophecy. We too should feel a sense of excitement because we also are part of that same great prophetic movement. But there is more. Now, this is a key to make the link between the Bible and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In other words, what he is saying, the church was predicted in prophecy since the time of John, before they were called Adventists. You can't mess with that. 
He continues, our text tells us in Revelation 10.10, 10, and I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. There could be no better summary of what happened next in our history than those prophetic words. The founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church had all been Millerites. That is, they were followers of William Miller, an American Baptist farmer turned preacher, who proclaimed that Christ would return around 1843 or 1844, at the end of the 2300-day prophecy, as he understood it. For us living today more than 160 years after that event, it is hard to imagine how precious was our pioneers' experience as they approached October 22, 1844, the date that from their study they had determined was the end of Daniel's long-time prophecy. The experience was especially sweet during the last few weeks and days prior to October 22. Hiram Edson probably summarized the experience as graphically as anyone. And I quote, We looked for our coming Lord until the clock told 12 at midnight. The day had then passed and our disappointment became a certainty. Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted and such a spirit of weeping came over us as I never experienced before. We wept and wept till the day dawn." End of quote. But Revelation chapter 10 still has one more verse. Verse 11, And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples, and nations, and tongues, and kings. Admittedly, in the disappointment our Adventist pioneers did not fully comprehend this verse, especially the part about prophesying again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. The worldwide work being assigned them to do would only gradually dawn upon their minds, and so also the expanded message that they were to preach, including the Sabbath, the sanctuary, state of the dead, health, etc. However, even this brief overview reminds us why Seventh-day Adventists see our prophetic history foretold in Revelation 10. But this is only the first of our three prophetically identified characteristics. Let's now review why we find our prophetic identity forecast in Revelation 12. So bear in mind the great disappointment was prophesied. Sweet in the mouth is the joy of the second coming predicted by Miller. Bitter in the belly was the disappointment of the failed prediction. However, this is where God got the attention of the Seventh-day Adventist Church through Ellen White's vision, confirming that all of this was part of prophecy to bring about the preaching of the true gospel to the world. Listen carefully to this. While several other churches keep the Seventh-day Sabbath, that is, Seventh-day Baptists, Church of God, Seventh-day, etc. Not one, not one of them fits both identifying characteristics given here, that of keeping the commandments, all ten of them, and not of having a renewal of the genuine gift of prophecy in the midst. On the other hand, there are some churches who claim to have the gift of prophecy in their midst, but they do not keep all ten of the commandments. So to be the church keeping the Sabbath without the prophet is a fail. Having the prophet without the Sabbath is a fail. So the churches mentioned can never be the true church, and the Latter-day Saints could never be the true church. If you claim to have a prophet and you don't keep all of the Ten Commandments, it is clear that your prophet is inspired by the devil. The two main identifying marks are the Sabbath and the prophecy. Not so much to predict the future, but to explain scripture. 
He continues, in 1846, Ellen Hammond became the wife of Elder James White. So from then on, she was known as Ellen G. White. Her ministry would, one, extend for a period of 70 years from 1844 until her death in 1915. Number two, during that time, she had an estimated 2,000 visions. And three, she authored more than 5,000 periodical articles in addition to 24 books plus two unpublished manuscripts before her death. Now, after more than 150 years to observe the fruit of her work, it can be demonstrated without question that the counsels God gave us through Ellen White are sound. They have stood the test of time. Any candid appraisal of our denomination's history forces us to admit that we have prospered when we have followed God's leading through the spirit of prophecy. And we have faltered on those occasions when we have not. He continues, Ellen White wrote, and I quote, in a very special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining the wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. End of quote. Testimonies for the Church, volume 9, page 19. For more than 160 years, Adventists have been proclaiming the three angels' messages. The first two, the preaching of the everlasting, or final gospel, in the setting of judgment hour message, and the call to come out of Babylon, were both first sounded by the Millerites. It would take those disappointed Millerites who eventually founded our church some time before they discovered the significance of the third angel's message. But after discovering the obligation and the privilege of keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath, they soon also came to realize its theological and prophetic significance in relation to the third angel's message. Tragically, some Seventh-day Adventists today have lost their prophetic focus. May I humbly suggest that if that even happens to you, if you ever lose your Adventist bearings, then focus again on this unique message that God has given to us to proclaim to the world. So, in conclusion, yes, at the end of time, there will be a faithful commandment-keeping group of individuals here on earth. In addition, as we have seen, Christ also told John on Patmos 1,800 years in advance that these faithful people will be distinguished from all other religious bodies in three unique ways. One, their history would allow an unusual but foreordained pattern. Two, they would be identified by two precise characteristics. And three, they would have a special, unique message to proclaim to the world. Only seven of the Adventists fit this entire description exactly. The fact that we have been called to say something unique just before Christ's second coming is nothing for us to boast about. After all, the message we have been given to proclaim is not our message, but God's. As I have already mentioned, tragically, some Seventh-day Adventists today have no idea what they believe anymore. Consequently, sometimes they follow one group's teachings, and at other times they follow someone else's. In all candor, the internet is making it increasingly easy for disoriented Adventists to do just that. My friends, Satan uses the very same tactics on us today 
as he did when tempting Christ in the wilderness 2,000 years ago. Satan's objective then and now is to try to confuse and sow doubts through the use of subtle questions. He wants to undermine our sense of prophetic identity and mission. Satan did not interrogate Christ out there in the wilderness because he really wanted any information from him. And the same is true today of those self-avowed critics who raise question after question in their relentless attacks upon this church. All Satan wanted back then from Christ and all Satan wants today from us is any demonstration that would signify a loss of faith in our divine assignment. Such a promise back then would have ruined Christ and such a compromise today will ruin us collectively as a church as well as individually as members. Brothers and sisters, God is counting on us. Our prophetic movement has a special end time work to do. God forbid that we Seventh-day Adventists ever lose our sense of prophetic focus and mission. Rather, may we once again experience the excitement and commitment of our pioneers who realized that God wanted to work through them to finish his work here on earth. May that same sense of wonder and dedication be the experience of each one of us here today, is my prayer. So here you have it, the conundrum, confusion of who is the true remnant. The Catholic Church does not consider itself any remnant but the true church that Jesus left. The Jehovah's Witnesses have found the true path that leads to eternal life. The Seventh-day Adventist was prophesied in existence hundreds of years before. Everyone is doing the work for Christ. Everyone is ordained by Christ to do that work. And therefore, for anyone to be saved, they must align themselves with this body of believers. To be outside of that is to be lost. That is the essence of it all. There is the guilt of stepping outside of that circle and being so questions for you to ponder on. One, do you believe that Peter was the first Pope? Hence, the Roman Catholic Church is the true church. Second question, do you believe that the Jehovah's Witnesses have found a true path with their 1914 installation of Christ? And number three, do you believe that Revelation 10.10 10 does refer to the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Now, from the moment you say no to any question, then you are simply saying this cannot be the case. What do you get from these studies? An attack on your church? That is all you can get from this? Am I wrong for uplifting Jesus? Are you telling me that you will discredit the preaching of Jesus and him crucified because it is not linked to a church? The internet is there for many reasons. Can you not think of it that way? God has allowed individuals to be able to speak to people across the globe with a reminder through the internet that salvation is not through anyone or any denomination. So if you are given a message for the world, your movement should be about the people and salvation, not about the people joining the body to be saved. That's the point I'm trying to make. It should be people finding Jesus. I think we are failing to see this point. The Jews considered themselves a body and no one was saved outside of them. Jesus came and presented himself and his father outside the body. This is why he said there was more faith outside of Israel in the person of the Roman officer. And that Gentiles will believe faster than Jews and they will sit with, with Abraham and Isaac. In the kingdom, we are all Gentiles spreading the message to Gentiles. Let us not make ourselves spiritual Jews and behave the same way like the Jewish people. Let us start preaching Jesus. Everything is about Jesus and watch the people fall in love with him and not fall in line with us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sharing the word with humanity, Jesus. We are still on the crossroad of who is the true church, who is the remnant. It is not about church or denomination, but it's about Jesus. May we lift him high, high so that men and women may be drawn unto him. May our focus be about Jesus. 
Bless us, Lord, and may we keep searching your word. Give us enlightenment, we pray, for we ask this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks again for watching. If you have been blessed, feel free to like, share, and subscribe if you have not yet done so. And as you do so, may you rest in the wise, objective, resourceful, and definitive word of God. Thank you.